I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry for the future, for I know what Jesus said, and today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Every step is getting brighter as the goal. the sky. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I Psalm 567, 567. <clears throat> In the dark of the midnight have I all hid my face, while the storms howl above me, and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Till the storm passes by, 
Many times Satan whispered, There is no use to try, For there's no end of sorrow, There's no hope by and by. Till the storm passes over, Till the thunder sounds no more, Till the clouds grow forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of my hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. When the law and the storms come no more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, Till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Good evening. Hope you guys had a, a good day. The sun is shining finally. And uh, I looked at my rain gauge and I had two and one tenth inch of a rain uh, over the last, what, 48 hours or something like that. And we had an inch of rain at the beginning of the week, so three and one tenth inches of rain uh, over the course of this week. That's, that's quite a lot of rain. And uh, I asked Brother Kim this morning. He told me he was going to be here at like 10 15 and he'd get here till like 10 25. I asked him if he had to wait on a ferry boat to get him across the Cache River. Yeah. And uh, he didn't know what I was talking about at first. I had to explain it to him. But um, that's, that we got a lot of rain. But it is good to see the, the sun shining. If you have your Bible, turn me to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. The title of the message this evening is Lost Power. Lost power. The interesting passage of scripture here in Second Kings chapter six, and um, it's it's a miracle that takes place in in the ministry of um, Elisha, and um, so we we want to look at this tonight and consider uh, lost power, the source of lost power. And I want you to think about a couple of questions: What is revival? Number one, what is revival, and what do we need a revival of? What is revival, and what do we need a revival of? Second Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried, and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore, said he, take it up to thee, and he put out his hand and took it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, assemble together and to worship tonight. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity for us to open uh, our Bibles and to read your word. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, be in our midst, that you would be glorified in all this we say and do tonight, the Lord. But, uh, Lord, we do ask that you would encourage us through uh, the reading and teaching of your word tonight. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So we asked the question, 
what is a revival and what do we need a revival of? Um, here a little bit of context of what's taking place in uh, the passage before us. Uh, Elisha is there with the sons of the prophets and they, they said to Elisha, we need to get and we need to go um, and, and dwell uh, on the other side of the Jordan. Basically, they're saying uh, it's not, it's not uh, good that we stay here uh, too long, basically. They say it's not straight for us, right? Uh, and that's language that we don't necessarily understand. Um, but notice also that whenever they go, uh, as, as they are leaving, they are going to build a house of worship. They're going to a place where they can worship God, and they're going to uh, assemble there together, and, and they're going to build a place of worship. Now, we likewise are in the process of building in our own lives a place of worship, right? Now, over the past couple of months, we've uh, kind of been displaced and, and not had the opportunity to meet here in the building proper that we call uh, the church. But, but we understand that we are the church outside of the walls of this, that the church goes with each and every one of us. And truly, the place of worship for us is wherever we find ourselves uh, throughout the day that we are able to, to worship God freely uh, where we're at. And so we ourselves are building a place of worship. We're also working for God. Uh, these uh, individuals, as they were uh, prof the sons of the prophets, they would have been working uh, in, the, in the work of, of uh, God, and, and they uh, were going to uh, dwell on the other side of Jordan. And as they go, uh, they said, let's, let's go and let's make a place to worship. And they stop at the Jordan River to cut beans, to take wood with them. Uh, the place that they would have been going would have been not necessarily uh, desolate, but it would have not had trees uh, there available for them to build. It would have been kind of like maybe going over here somewhere where we're at to build something. Trees aren't readily available here anymore, right? Uh, there was a day and time where the railroad went through here uh, specifically to pick up lumber. There was a lumber business in this area, uh, which is non-existent anymore. Uh, and, and of course, we know that that's just the nature of agriculture and having fields and those types of things. And, um, and that's just the way it is here. They were going to a place kind of similar, I think. They were going to a place that uh, didn't have the available timbers to build the place of worship. And so they stopped in the area of the Jordan, which would have had uh, plentiful timber. And it was there that they selected the timber and they were cutting it to take with them to build this place of worship. Um, we too are working for God, uh, and Elisha is asked to go with them. They needed uh, his presence. They, they wished that he would go with them, and he agrees. He says, I will go. Um, and, and I want us to notice something here, that as, as these men, in specifically in the context of, of the seven verses that, that we are looking at, they don't make it to the destination to build the place of worship, right? They are cutting the timber uh, in the Jordan uh, River Valley area. They're, they're making preparations to do so, but they're working in doing that. And in the midst of the work, this one man has a problem with his tool, right? Anybody ever get to do a job and their tools break down? They have a problem? This guy is borrowing a tool. You ever borrowed a tool from somebody and it, and it broke? It messed up. Um, it happens from time to time, doesn't it? It makes you kind of leery of loaning stuff out, and, and I, I'm kind of the same way. Um, but it never fails when I do borrow something. Uh, typically something goes wrong. Uh, hopefully not all the time, but sometimes that does happen. In this case, uh, the axe head falls off of the axe. Now, did it just do it automatically? Did it, did it just fall off? No, I, I don't believe so. I think he was working. He was chopping. And, and with every strike of the axe, the head was working its way off slowly but surely. And, and eventually, uh, one too many, without paying attention to what he was doing, in the midst of his work, the axe head fell off and it, and it sunk uh, in, in the river. The axe head, in this context, I'm going to apply it to the power of the Lord. This man was unable at this point to do any more work. Why? Because he didn't have a tool, right? He had no more power to cut the tree. And for us, as we do God's work, 
we need God's power at work in us, right? It enables us. It, it propels us in the work that he has given us to do. Um, it, it gives us the ability to overcome temptation. It, it uh, helps us in our prayer life. You know, have you ever been in a, in a period of time in life when you just don't know what to pray about? Uh, God's power in our life gives us the ability to persevere through those times. Or maybe you're, you're in a period of prayer and, and you need to focus in on something or, and you're trying to, to be specific and, and trying to make the time to spend time in prayer and all the other cares of the world kind of come flooding through your mind and, and, and you can't stop thinking about everything else but you know you need to be praying specifically about something. God's power at work in us enables us or gives us the encouragement we need to persevere in our prayer life. It also gives us the ability to be a successful witness. And it's difficult to put yourself on the line, to be vulnerable before fellow uh, people and neighbors, to, to go and, and, and to share your testimony sometimes. You know, um, Brother Jackie, I was talking to him here a while back, and I, I, we were talking about the people in Grubbs, and he said, you know, there was a day and time where I knew everybody that lived in this town. He said, that's not the case anymore. New people move in, don't they? they? They come to town, they don't know you from when you were a kid, and they don't know you uh, from your past. They know who you are today, and, and that can be a difficult thing to humble yourself before them and to share with them, this is what God has done for me in my life. He has, he's brought me from, from the miry pit, and he's lifted me out, and he's put me on, on solid ground, right? Right? That is, every one of us have that testimony, but we also have a witness that we live out every single day. And the power of God at work in us helps us to be successful in that. And it gives us the ability to effectively teach others about who he is. Matthew chapter 28, verses, verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And in Acts 1, 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Certainly we see from Scripture that God's power is something that we need to be a intricate, important part of who we are as His disciples as we live our life here on this earth. What is a revival? What do we need a revival of? I think we need a revival of God's power in our lives. And, and hopefully tonight we can, we can come to a point where we understand not just uh, within the church do we need that uh, revival, but we need it within our individual lives as well. Um, notice, I want us to notice some things about the individual here that lost the axe head. He lost his power for service when it fell off, right? And it's kind of like uh, the story about the, the man who was hired to, to fell trees, and he, he was uh, really getting with it there at the first of the day, and the old timers, you know, they, he was cutting way more timber than they were at the first of the day, and the old timers, they were kind of struggling to keep up, and boy, noontime came, and he was... He was way ahead for the count on the day. But by the time the day was up, the old timers had cut more because he never took time to stop and take care of his equipment. The same is true for us when we get into the act of service for God. A lot of times we can get so wrapped up in the doing part that we forget about tending to ourselves and to our own needs and taking time to, to read the Bible for, for us. Uh, as, as pastors, a lot of times uh, when, when we get into a group of individuals, uh, the topic will come up about, about what are you reading? What are you studying? A lot of times somebody will say, well, I'm, I'm preaching through this, I'm preaching through that. And when the question is asked, what are you reading? What are you, what are you studying? It's not what are you preaching through, but what are you doing for yourself? Because even as, even as a preacher, as we read and we study Scripture, we can get to a point where we just are going through the motions and we're in the service act of things and we're not taking care of the personal impact of the power of God that needs to be at work in our own lives. 
And so we try to effectively encourage one another to take the time and to think about that and to be proactive in that in our own lives. This individual in the, in the passage before us, he once had the power, but now it was gone. Suddenly and unexpectedly, something happened and it was gone. Boy, can we relate to that or what? Suddenly and unexpectedly, a virus struck our world and the ability to do things the way that we're used to doing them is gone. Poof. Who would have ever thought? Right? Now, I don't know that here in, in our neck of the woods we've been affected the way that uh, you see reports on, on the TV or hear things that are taking place in other parts of the world. Um, but, but we understand that there is... Uh, an impact, and, the, and there's, there's a fallout as a result of that. And when things suddenly and unexpectedly get, get uh, taken away and we are useless without power, can you imagine what it's like to be useless for a work in which you are needed very much? One of the things that we uh, tried to uh, stress at the beginning of the year was to, to make time to to read through the Bible this year. Now, we have the the plaque that's over here in the library, and I brought that out and kind of showed some of y'all and uh, tried to encourage that. When this uh, happened, we were no longer able to come together and and to meet. That was one of the things that I tried to to stress in the messages that we were um, giving online and. And doing things was take time to read for yourselves as a family or in your home. To make the opportunity available to yourself to, to still be fed and to be within uh, the working of who God is in your life. Not to have that disconnect. Because when we have the disconnect, we find it difficult to accomplish the task that's been laid before us. When the Spirit is grieved, power for service is lost. It's like unplugging something from an electrical outlet, right? If you're using a power saw to cut a piece of wood and somebody walks up behind you and unplugs it, what happens? The saw quits turning, right? The blade quits moving. You quit cutting. Um, the same is true whenever we disconnect from God and His Word and His presence in our lives. We find ourselves useless for the work which we've been called to do. And not only did this individual lose the power for service, but he also lost the power while he was working. Again, he was in the middle of doing the work, right? He was felling the tree. He was cutting the tree. He was felling a beam. He didn't lose his power through laziness or idleness. He simply did not watch what was going on and be careful and maintain that proper maintenance to the tool which he was using. Now, I think we can all agree today that there are those who are lazy and, and they are idle, but the times the power has really been lost, I believe, is simply through neglect of the individual disciple to maintain the relationship that they have with God and they count on other people to service that for them. You know, we... we talk a lot of times at, at my house, you know, with, with family members and different things. Uh, there was a day and time where uh, if you need something fixed, you did it yourself, right? Uh, you did it yourself. Now things have become so specialized, you can't hardly do things for yourself anymore. You have to take it to somebody else to service it. I'm glad tonight that for my relationship with Christ, I don't have to take it to a specialist to be able to maintain it, but he gives me the opportunity to do that myself. I have the ability, because of Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary, to go boldly into the, into the throne room of God as a result of that relationship that I have with Jesus. I have the ability in my life to open God's word, and which I have, I don't know, more Bibles than I know what to do with, probably. Um, I've got one in my truck. I've got one in the church van. I've got any version I want to find on my phone. Uh, I got three or four on the shelf in here. I've got two in my bedroom right now. I've got one on top of the refrigerator in the house. I've got Bibles everywhere, right? So if there's not maintenance taking place in my life, 
and getting into God's word, it's whose fault? My fault. Just as it was this guy's fault. He was doing the work, but he wasn't maintaining his equipment. And the axe had slowly slid off the handle. See, we can become active when we forget uh, the work of the Holy Spirit and we just do things because that's what we do, right? We come to church because, well, we just go to church. What happens when we can't go to church, right? You ever thought about, well, what happens when we can't open this? It's not on our phone. What happens? Oh, that'll never happen. It's happened all around the world. We can't say it'll never happen because sin is rampant. And the Bible tells us that the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. So we can't depend on the fact that we'll always have it, but we need to do the preparation work now. So that what if? We need to be prepared. We can't simply become idle and through obligation do the things which we do just because that's what we do. But we need to be active in it and we need to understand that the work of the Holy Spirit is pertinent to who we are and what we've been called to do. But I think for too many of us, pride and self-interest can cause the axe head to start to slip off. When that happens, we have to do something fast. We have to give God first place, and we have to let the Holy Spirit work within our life. I want to notice something else about this individual in our passage tonight. He didn't only lose the power to do what he was doing, right? He, he didn't lose, just lose the power for service, but he lost the power while working, but he also lost something that wasn't his. It was borrowed. Do we understand tonight that the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within each and every one of us is something that which is not our own, but it is on loan from God himself. The things which we enjoy, our homes, our food, our money, our vehicles, our tools, our Bibles, our bodies, they're all His. They're all on loan. All of, every bit of it is His. And if we aren't careful, we can lose something that is not our own very quickly. Our power for service is just borrowed. So power is what God has given us to be able to do the work which we've been called to do. And without that power, we can never do what God has asked us to do. Oh, we, can, we can make attempts at it, but we can't ever really be good at it. And we're accountable for how we use it. And our power comes from Christ and His shed blood. And the power to live a Christian life is not with, within us, but it comes from God. Power for service must come from him. We can't rely on any other source. I want to notice something else about this individual. He was painfully conscious of his loss, wasn't he? What did he do as soon as the axe head went in the water? You ever stop to think about that? As soon as the axe head disappeared, he realized his uselessness and it was noticed at the time that it was needed most. He was about to hit the tree again. There's something missing. Continuing to swing the handle would have accomplished nothing at that point. But you know what I think many people are doing that today? They're continuing to swing a handle with no axe head. There's no power of God at work in their life and they're just going through the motions and they're useless for the task which they've been called to do because they haven't maintained the necessary equipment. Look at times when we need power the most. You ever thought about it that way? I think if we are all honest and we begin to look back at our life, we can all see times and maybe 
maybe even recognize that right now in our life, that possibly the power is gone. You know what? We're not alone in that. It happens to the best of us. The power disappears, right? It, it, it goes away. We get busy and we don't take time to maintain the relationship. We don't take time to take care of, of us. And it can be caused by a number of things. Temptations or trials. Difficulty in witnessing or struggling to pray or just being an example. We, can, we struggle through it in all of those things. And if we just get in the motion of doing those things, we can quickly lose the power which we need so desperately to accomplish those tasks. But something else that we need to notice about this individual, as soon as he realized the power was gone, he appealed to his master. As soon as he realized that there was a problem, no one else could help him, he went to the master. Master, it was borrowed. Help. You know what? We too must call on our master. Be plain. Be specific. Now, I think that's something that we have difficulty doing sometimes is being specific. Because human relationships have taught us to be vague, right? Unless you're sending your wife to the park store to get something, then you got to draw a diagram sometimes, right? Or call ahead. My wife's the only one that comes back with her own part sometimes. It happens. I'll be honest, she sent me to the grocery store to get stuff before I come back with the wrong thing. It happens both directions. It's not just women. Us guys do it too, right? We make up. We, we, we mess up. We, we have a problem. We have to be plain and specific with God. We have to. If there's sin in our life, we need to be specific about it. Who are you fooling? God's not fooled. He knows exactly what the problem is. And he wants us to be specific and detailed with him. Be plain about it. And tell God, hey God, I'm not feeling the power of your spirit right now. It's gone. And I need help. Explain how it happened. I was, I was working. I was doing these things. And, and, and all of a sudden, it, it was just gone and it sunk in the water. And, and it, I need help. In our passage, Elisha comes over and says, well, show me where it went down. And he pointed the exact spot where it was at. Elisha cuts a branch off the tree and he throws it in. And the axe head floats. You know what? God does not fail to give for that which will bring him honor and glory. When we're specific with God and we say, this is how it happened. This is where I last felt your power and presence in my life. And God, I need it back. He never fails. And he will miraculously restore that which was lost. The individual in the passage says, that's where it was at. There was no other place he could find it, right? He couldn't go 100 yards upstream. Wouldn't have done any good to go downstream. It was iron. Iron don't float. Not naturally. He had to go to the spot. And he found it where he lost it. And you will find the lost power back where you failed to listen to the Holy Spirit. God will not take second place. He will not do that for us in our lives. Because when he takes second place, that means no power. And no power means no results, right? There's no fulfilling that what you're called to do. And so, if there's, if there's no power, is there any use trying? 
Is there any use going through the motions just because that's what we do? Is there any sense in going to look anywhere else for it? No. He got it where he lost it. But he also got it through a miracle. Was there anything special about that tree branch? No. I don't believe so. It was just an inanimate object that Elisha saw and he took advantage of an opportunity to teach a lesson. You know what? God does the same thing for us in our lives, doesn't he? He uses inanimate objects to teach us lessons in life. To show us his might and his power at work. To say, listen, if I want to use this tree branch to make that iron float, which it ain't going to do, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I'm God. And I have the ability to make things do that which they just won't do on their own. God does that with us all the time. But he got it through a miracle. Elisha threw the tree branch in. And notice what it says. The iron did what? It don't say float. Swam. The iron did swim. There in, uh, let's see, what verse is that? Verse 6, very last word, the iron did swim. Now, other translations may translate it float, but King James, uh, we're looking at, says that it swam. I don't care how you cut it, how you translate it, iron isn't supposed to do those things. Whether it float or whether it swam, it ain't supposed to do it. But I think God kind of went above and beyond and said, listen, I can make it float, but watch this, I can make it swim like a fish. We need reminders like that in our lives. To be reminded that every gift of power is a miracle of grace. Look at the cross. What Jesus did there. And he, did he have to die on the cross that way? No. He could have died a thousand ways, right? And still be written in and said, this is God's gift to humanity, right? That his son was given for, for our sins. But what has the cross become? It's become this tree branch. It's become a symbol to humanity for centuries that this is what God did for you. And he did it on an end of an object. He did it on the cross of Calvary. And on that cross, on those two wooden beams, he wiped away the sins of those who would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for that tonight. I'm thankful for that gift that God gave. I'm thankful for the grace of God. It's a miracle that you and I have before us that we're able to receive His love and His forgiveness at the foot of the cross. I don't know about everybody that may watch this, or maybe in the room. God knows our hearts. He sees to the innermost part of your being, to the compartments of, of your life and your thoughts that, that you don't think will ever be revealed. God sees right into the middle of that. And he sees it as if it was right out in the middle of the wide open, plastered on a billboard on the busiest freeway in the world. That's how clearly God sees it. And yet he gave his son Jesus on the cross of Calvary so that you can receive forgiveness and eternal life through his son Jesus. And all you have to do is take out your hand and receive it. God's willing to meet the need of your heart if you're willing to let him. And I believe tonight that he's willing to bring revival. Revival is a topic that's talked about a lot. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thought that we've come to um, 
kind of package up in our culture as, as, as a group of services that the church would, would hold and have maybe a, a guest speaker come in and, and they would hold a revival service, right? Revival is not a week of services or two weeks of services. The revival is something that takes place in the heart of a human being. When God takes that which was lost and he makes it new. He restores it. So whether you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you've just been going through the motions without the axe head on the axe, I understand tonight that we can receive the revival that God has in store for us if we're willing to be honest and upfront and plain with God. Will we put out our hand and take it? Or will we let it pass? The decision is yours. What will it be? Jesus is willing. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you for your word. God, we're thankful for reminders that we find all through Scripture of just how powerful you are. And when we look at impossibilities such as this axe head that was lost in the river, not only did it float, but it swam back to the shore. And we say, that's impossible. And yet you did it. We can look at something like that and we can, we can look at our own lives and we can say it's impossible for that to happen or that to happen. Because the world is just too far gone or I'm just too bad of a person. I've done too much bad stuff in my life. And it's impossible not impossible. Nothing is impossible with you, God. I thank you for this reminder from your word tonight. I ask that you would remind me over and over and over every day of your power so that I can be plugged into it, God. So that I can accomplish the task that you've called me to do. I thank you for our church, Lord, and and the people that, that are a part of it, our church family, and I pray that they too will be seeking your power in their lives to not just go through the motions of things just because that's how it's been done for, for centuries, but because this is who you called us to be. And we'll be your people. And you'll be our God. And one day we'll be united face to face. God, we look so to that but we can't wait for it God while you tarry may we be at the work that you called us to do through your power and your might we ask these things in Jesus precious name Amen Amen I want to thank you all for being here tonight and I um, want to mention a few uh, prayer requests that uh, we've been going over on Wednesday nights. Uh, there is a, a lady from Oklahoma that, that we know uh, from our time there. Uh, her name is Lori, and she has a son, Cameron. And Cameron uh, has recently, uh, uh, he's been diagnosed with, um, uh, what is that? Uh, basically, he can be one way one minute, and the next minute he's completely different. I forget what minute. Bipolar, yeah. And uh, so they're kind of working through things with that and, and trying to figure out that. Her son, you know, he's, he's not very old, but a um, teenager, I think. But pray for, pray for them as they maneuver through that um, and their family, that God would give them uh, the comfort and guidance that they need. Um, and then uh, J.H. Allen, we want to continue to remember him and Miss um, June in your prayers. Uh, they've been out and about. He's getting around a little bit better. Danny and them aren't having to get him in and out of bed anymore. So um, I think they're glad about that. But uh, 
And it also opens up opportunities as he gets to feeling better for him to wander off. And so pray for him. Pray for his uh, strength and his healing, but also for wisdom to know that he can't go and do the things that he used to do all the time and, and to be smart about that. And uh, Anna McClure got to come home. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for God's work in her life. Uh, she was featured on a story out of Little Rock, I think KRK did uh, on the news this last week. And I want to give God praise for, for that in her life. Uh, it's a big deal. You know, we don't hear too many stories about people her age who go in and, or on a ventilator, much less on a ventilator for two weeks. Um, you know, and then for the doctor to say, hey, girls, you need to come up here and uh, you say you goodbye. And then for her to walk out. Uh, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. We want to give God praise for that tonight. Um, we want to continue to pray for our medical personnel, pastors and churches that are, are reopening and trying to do things safely, um, wisely. Uh, but still want to, to glorify God in, in the things we're doing. We want to continue to pray for that. Uh, of course, our state and national leaders. Uh, Matt and Becky Adams. Becky uh, asked prayer for her aunt uh, this past Wednesday night. Uh, Kevin Shelton. Uh, Kara has got some more tests coming up. We want to continue to pray for her. Um, and then, of course, Miss Janet healing up from her uh, procedure. Uh, I think she everything went good there. She just got some bruising and stuff that's got to go away, and she'll be back to running around and doing, doing her thing. So, um, I want to give God praise for that as well. Any other prayer requests tonight? Well, I want to thank God for our kids. Man, I was looking back at pictures from when we first got here. Y'all realize how fast they've grown? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, you know, Katie, Katie was just, you know, and now she's 15, you turn 15, 14. I won't speed her up. I'm sorry. Um, but still, I see her driving with, with her grandma. We have to take off driving. She's not supposed to be doing those things yet. Um, and here she's got a birthday today, and we're thankful for, for her and, and uh, the rest of these goobers up here. Uh, thankful for them. But um, we've got a good group of kids here in our church, and I'm thankful for them. Let's stand tonight. We'll be dismissed. Charlie, will you close us in prayer? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you made us. Bless this day. Thank you for everything you made us. In Jesus' name, amen.